the ECB and particularly to the statistics uh, stream for NRL and for inviting uh, me to be uh, the chair of this uh, panel. It's a real honor and I think it's interesting that you're marking 20 years of ECB statistics. Those conferences tend to be somewhat retrospective but I think it's nice that we actually turned it around and said let's look to the uh, to the future, and uh, I think we're covering several areas of the uh, of the demand side of for uh, for statistics, which are very relevant for central bankers. We talked about uh, monetary policy, and now we talk about financial uh, stability. Uh, I think the overarching aim is to better assess systemic risks, not only as in, a, in a monitoring perspective, but also as an input into into policy making to calibrate various. Uh, and design various, various policy tools which are increasingly being rolled out both in Europe and, and globally. Um, I think it's, there's a sense that supervisory data and let's say traditional financial sector data, the MFI, aggregated MFI perspective for instance is not, uh, is not enough. We need to better understand linkages, linkages between the financial sector and the real economy and also linkages within the um, within the financial sector to understand exactly how shocks get transmitted and where the real fragilities might, uh, might lie. There's, I think, a need to cut the cake in different ways. We can have a national view, but there's also, since we're dealing with cross-border institutions, uh, uh, you need to view these institutions from a slightly broader perspective. There's the issue of non-bank financial intermediation. We're not talking things like crowdfunding, fintech, uh, new forms of funds and so on, which if you just focus on the narrow MFI or the banking sector view is going to leave important uh, issues on the table. There seem to be specific needs, I think, also from the borrower-based requirements that are being uh, being implemented. I think some of the, uh, uh, the speakers will, will address this point. Uh, new data, and I think we had actually in Estonia some good uh, experience when we were rolling out these borrower-based requirements we wanted to establish the instrument, but we didn't want to do it in a binding way, so you had to calibrate it to be uh, pretty much in line with what the, the practice in the market at the time, and only through using this fairly granular view uh, was that uh, possible, and I think the rollout went pretty, uh, pretty well. And as was discussed in the first panel, we're going to repeat a lot of things already, the greater interest in granular data, and as many speakers mentioned, uh, this issue about benefits versus costs, or maybe the data needs versus data wishes uh, issue. I think for analysts and uh, people, if you say, would, would a new data series be, be useful? Of course, since the price is zero, the demand can be almost infinite. And somebody somewhere will always say it's a great idea to have an uh, additional data source, but the sector, I guess, is already chafing under quite a little bit, quite a bit of uh, reporting responsibility. Sometimes you often think it becomes almost as important as the core business for, uh, for financial institutions. So finding that balance is, is very, uh, very important. I think the first session put some ideas on the table. So to discuss these, uh, these issues, we have a great uh, and diverse panel. I won't go along into the bios because I think most people here know, are familiar with the speakers. We'll start with Philip Lane, Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, and more recently, uh, Chair of the Advisory Technical Committee of the ESRB, and Richard Berner is Executive in Residence and, and Adjunct Professor at the New York University Stern School. Third, then, Luis Pereira da Silva, who Deputy uh, General Manager of the BIS. And as discussant, uh, we have Hans Helmut Kotz, who divides his time between Frankfurt and Cambridge, Massachusetts, between Goethe and Harvard Universities. So I'll give each speaker 15, maximum 15 minutes, and we'll try to reserve a fair bit of time for questions from you as well. So Philip, please lead us off. Thank you, Arto. So it's a pleasure uh, to be on this panel. Uh, I think, of course, uh, we, we are following an interesting session this morning on monetary policy. And uh, uh, Natasha Valla, I think, uh, made the interesting point uh, about how much do you really need, uh, in terms of data, to run monetary policy? Maybe you just need the traditional uh, macro time series. Uh, but of course, when it comes to financial stability, uh, if there's a case for granularity for monetary policy, that's uh, even stronger again when we want to talk about uh, financial stability. Let me uh, just say, first of all, in terms of thinking about uh, central banking and financial stability, of course, there are different um, 
dimensions. There's essentially ex ante, which is uh, let's try and pres if, if the conditions are financially stable, let's see what we can do to preserve that. Uh, so that's a micro prudential issue in terms of uh, supervision. And of course, then you think about the data you need for effective supervision. And it's a macro prudential policy issue in terms of what data do you need to, as Arda just said, calibrate macro prudential measures. But uh, in addition, ex post, uh, if the crisis arises, uh, the conduct of uh, financial stability policies, which for central banks is going to be the conduct of uh, liquidity policies, uh, also has a heavy data requirement. And I think, there's, you know, I think that's an interesting issue. So whether it's ex ante or ex post, this is a, a big topic. Uh, I think uh, the organizers uh, have uh, really begged the question in terms of the composition of this panel, uh, which is a global in nature. So uh, through uh, uh, our work here in Europe, uh, through the work of the BIS, and of course with the uh, US authorities, it's clear that financial stability has a significant global component. And what's interesting is what can we do at an EU level, uh, so going above nation by nation data, uh, and then what can we do at a global level? So within the EU, the uh, European Systemic Risk Board has a unique role in terms of uh, the coordination of macro potential policies. Uh, and also in terms of having the oversight of, of uh, data streaming out of every nation state. So the ESRB, has, for example, is a unique uh, window into, for example, the derivatives data collected under EMIR. Uh, and of course, here at the ECB, uh, in terms of macroprudential policy, because ECB has top-up powers, uh, for example, in relation to the counter-cyclical capital buffer, uh, it's necessary, and I would heavily endorse, it's a very good idea that in addition to the national level use of macroprudential policy, the option to top up at ECB level uh, provides an additional layer of uh, discipline, and therefore the ECB needs to ha have that uh, uh, overview as well. And of course, macroprudential policy is quite, you know, in, uh, immature, as in it's fairly recent, it's widespread use. And so the more we can learn from each other, I think that's quite important. And to learn from each other, the common data platform, I think is quite important. So uh, there's a lot going on uh, within the European system. And of course, uh, there's gonna be a parallel conversation at the global level through the uh, BIS, the FSB, the IMF, and so on. Uh, but of course, uh, the uh, extent of data sharing at a global level is quite limited. In fact, I think the exception proves the rule. I mean, the most important exception is the BIS data hub, uh, which sh shares uh, in a very limited way the firm level data on uh, syst syst globally systemically important financial institutions among a small group of supervisors. Uh, but the fact that that's so heavily limited and ring fenced, you know, it's a big step forward, it's happening, but it does indicate, you know, what is the near term potential for much wider sh sharing of data? I think, uh, let's see. Let me emphasize with, uh, in terms of what's big steps forward, that really I think uh, one thing to notice, and one thing if you look at the ESRB working paper series, you see more and more, is uh, the value of uh, the uh, email data. So again, this is I think a big reporting uh, burden on, on those who are reporting, uh, and it's, it's vital that we demonstrate that in fact these data are useful, these statistics are useful. And I think uh, it's proving that way, that in terms of understanding what's going on, say, in the interest rate swap market, FX, uh, derivatives, uh, 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 credit default swaps, and so on, it's, I think it's proving already quite valuable. Uh, it need, needed the, and I think the same is going to be true, Anna Credit. There's going to be a little bit of a lag, because the, the researchers and the analysts need to learn the new data set, need to clean it up and so on, but I think uh, we, we, we can be increasingly confident of the value of that. Now, of course, uh, it, because it's European level uh, regulation, it doesn't capture everything we would like to know at a global level. And you know, I think uh, the more we can, uh, over a sufficient time span, to push for corresponding uh, data collection and data sharing at a global level in derivatives, I think that's really important. And of course, uh, important projects such as uh, common identifiers like the LEI is an important part of that journey. Let me switch actually now to um, 
the really side of, of uh, the international economy and the role of multinational firms. So multinational firms uh, in production, uh, we understand in terms of global value chains and all of that. Uh, but more and more uh, multinational firms are very important in the uh, global financial system. Uh, we've noticed, uh, you've noticed that some of these uh, firms make a lot of money and they have very large uh, treasury operations in terms of managing that cash. So if you think about global uh, savings and investments, understanding how multinationals allocate their, uh, their cash is quite important. You know, so, so I think there's a lot going on here. Uh, so I recently I co-authored with some BIS colleagues and a colleague at the Central Bank of Ireland. It's in the March uh, quarterly review of the BIS. Uh, you know, I think we put together our thoughts on this. Uh, but I think uh, really understanding the balance of payments these days when you have the multinational firms, not just in the, as I say, the real side in terms of the trade balance, but also in the financial account, I think is, is really important. Uh, you know, I think uh, also, of course, uh, these firms, uh, in terms of their treasury operations, mm -hmm. in terms of using, say, special purpose entities uh, in international financial centres, that really, uh, it's kind of uh, interesting to look at it, but really uh, understanding the headline BOP, understanding the headline uh, national accounts, and it's not just, uh, you know, uh, in my own country where this matters, it's, it's much more broader than that. Uh, you know, so I think the agility, maybe the question here is agility. I mean, it's good to have the stability. It's good that we know the rules for national accounting. Uh, it's good we're on BMP manual six as opposed to uh, having one every, every quarter. Uh, but, the, but the agility of how quickly can the world's statisticians catch up with what's going on in terms of the evolving practices of multinational firms, I think, is a challenge for this community. Uh, so, you know, coming back to the value of international data sharing, uh, that of course uh, uh, builds on trust, uh, and you know that that's a scarce commodity. So I'm not saying there's any uh, easy. Uh, you know, uh, often I hear in certain circumstances people say, "Well, just do it, just do it." So it's the Nike view of uh, uh, international data sharing: just do it. But that's not realistic. You do have to build build up to that point. And so the, the kind of uh, slog of working towards that, I think, is quite important. Let me turn to the borrower-based measures, because here we know the risk is in the tail of the distribution. So knowing the average loan-to-value ratio in, a, in the population is not super helpful. You do, need, you do need to think about what fraction of loans are in the different uh, parts of the distribution. So I don't really see how you can have a reliable system of borrower-based measures without the granular, granular loan by loan data. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, even better uh, if you can match that with other loan, uh, debtor characteristics like income level, employment status, non-mortgage debt, and so on. And this goes to acceptability. We talked a little bit about acceptability this morning. Uh, and for example, for us, I can tell you, because we have, a, we have a, say, the loan to value, we have loan to value ceilings and loan to income ceilings but we allow the banks to do a certain amount of lending above those ceilings. And what we do is we, we're able to demonstrate that, in fact, the use of those uh, ex exceptions, the above uh, ceiling lending, is in line with what people might think is desirable, as in younger people are more likely to get a bigger exception from loan to income, because their incomes grow over time. Uh, first time borrowers get a, more of an exception to loan to value, because again, uh, it's, uh, the, the case for that is made. So uh, I think uh, it's not just a question of what we need to set our policies, it's also a question of what's needed to demonstrate uh, that these policies are reasonable uh, from a social point of view. So let me in passing just mention, uh, we've just introduced a consumer credit register, and this is, I think, uh, the confidence of what's helpful for banks in terms of having a CCR that they can look at uh, can also have value for statisticians. Let me also mention, I think, uh, the, the value of cooperation, say, with tax authorities. Because what's really would be ideal is you're, you're able not just have the uh, point in time data about when you take out a mortgage loan, what are your characteristics, but also uh, uh, updated. So five years into your loan, 10 years into your loan, uh, what remains, and are, is there an update on your uh, characteristics such as employment status and so on? 
Let me turn uh, to an obvious financial stability risk, which is the boom-bust uh, cycle in, in property markets, whether that's residential or commercial property. So this is, uh, again, I think an area where Anna Credit should be quite useful because the Anna Credit should deliver much more information about uh, the distribution of exposures to the property sector, the interconnections across banks in relation to property exposures, the value of property collateral, and so on. So I think there's a, that you can uh, really see a, a tremendous potential here um, in that area. In relation to pricing, I think there's a, you know, there's more maturity in, in how we think about the construction of residential property price indices. But I think um, you know, the ESRB has highlighted the data gaps of commercial property prices. And there is an interesting issue about a purist approach where you want to build a comprehensive price index based on all commercial property transactions versus maybe a kind of risk-adjusted uh, approach where you may say, well, maybe the bigger concerns are certain slices of the commercial property sector, such as uh, prime real estate. So, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, and then uh, maybe just in trying to close, uh, Ardo mentioned the rising role of non-banks in the financial sector. And uh, although a certain amount of information is collected from investment funds and so on, I do think in terms of financial stability policies, having a better and more uniform way of thinking about the leverage and liquidity positions of investment funds may turn out to be helpful in the future. Uh, and really, you know, we have maybe can say we've accomplished a lot in terms of banking data. Maybe, you know, uh, we need to uh, ro pivot our attention towards these other sectors. Um, and then finally, the other issue is interconnections, the issue of uh, who to whom. So actually, I, I, it remains the case that what we've collected, it, it can be less than fully exploited because the ultimate owner, ultimate destination is, is very necessary. So it's kind of dissatisfying if you look at some data set and you see, okay, well now I know that, say the Cayman Islands is a big investor in some country. You know the Cayman Islands is just a conduit. So really understanding what is behind that is, I think, uh, remains, remains uh, a challenge. So uh, it's 20 years into, into uh, the ESCB's uh, work on, in these areas. I'm kind of a, the glass is basically uh, still half empty, if not, if not more than half empty. You know, so I, I think there's a still a, lot, a big uphill uh, mountain to climb. Uh, and so this goes back to cost issues. Uh, to reconcile the need for more data and uh, the, the actual costs, which is also not just on the reporters, it's also on us as central banks who've got to have the uh, systems in place to take in the data, uh, the efficiency issue where maybe the merger with data scientists, with IT and so on is just as important uh, as uh, the kind of uh, financial institutions and us ourselves. So let me stop there. Okay, thank you for a very wide-ranging set of thoughts and a very concise executive summary at the end saying we still got a long way to go. So, Richard Berner, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers uh, for uh, setting up this conference and for having me here. I'm honored to be here. And second, I want to congratulate Arl Schubert, with whom I've worked uh, over the past several years uh, for his leadership. Uh, and all his accomplishments uh, as uh, Director General of Statistics here at the ECB. Um, Arl, when he asked me to come here, uh, asked me to focus on uh, potential threats to financial stability and how statistics can inform decision making about them. Here today I'm going to talk about both uh, system-wide and enterprise risk assessment because I think that they should complement each other uh, and use the same basic data. Philip's example, I think, of the multinational firms is a great example how multinationals manage their risk is extremely important for us to understand uh, as policymakers uh, or whether we're doing research uh, in the area. Uh, and using the same basic data makes perfect sense, not just from an efficiency standpoint, but also because we also uh, need to use the same basic facts in talking about the phenomena that we're talking about. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, let's see, I need to advance this, uh, is that the way? Do you know which button to push? Uh, there we go, the big one, okay. 
Um, so let's see if it works. Okay. First, I'm going to talk about uh, some financial system vulnerabilities, and I've identified five just to try to keep the list relatively short. Um, second, uh, I'll talk about ways to achieve that effic efficiency and effectiveness and best practices to improve data quality, scope, and accessibility. Um, I'll talk about some critical data needs and give three examples. And finally, I'll make some comments about uh, some requirements to realize the potential uh, of using big data, new analytics, and new technology uh, to improve system-wide and enterprise risk assessment for, uh, and compliance. I think first, the data must be fit for purpose, uh, something we've already talked about, but I'll say some more. In addition, I think an effective partnership between and among regulators and between regulators and industry is essential to align their use of these tools and to standardize them to make them interoperable. So first, to the vulnerabilities. Um, I think first there are still vulnerabilities in uh, securities financing transactions, um, market-based finance and, and shadow banking, and I draw the distinction between those. We can still see that the default uh, of a broker-dealer can create fire sale externalities uh, on a post basis. So I'll talk a little bit about those data needs. Uh, second, um, we've mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the session um, <clears throat> the transition from LIBOR to alternative reference rates. Uh, LIBOR's foundation still remains fragile, and I think its widespread and ongoing use is going to make that transition a challenging one. Market participants must have confidence in the new reference rates, which, among other things, I think involves the integrity of the data that underlie them. So I'll talk a little bit about the U.S. experience there. There are three other, other vulnerabilities that are also top of mind. Um, first, operational and cyber threats, uh, including those from cyber incidents. They may accelerate, especially against a backdrop of rapid innovation and technical change. Um, second, uh, the current move to uh, either tapering or actually normalizing monetary policy may expose vulnerabilities in rising corporate leverage and deteriorating uh, credit underwriting and credit quality. That's certainly true in the United States. And third, uh, fragmentation and even conflict among national policies, I think, may test the resilience of cross-border arrangements in global financial markets uh, in response to external shocks. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of those, but I'll just make uh, three comments. First, the heterogeneity comment. Uh, as Philip mentioned, I think that all, through, all five of these require the use of granular data because we are interested in tail risk and because we can't understand that unless the data are fairly granular. Second, uh, this list is not exhaustive. Uh, and uh, therefore, when we think about the many of vulnerabilities that we might face in allocating our resources to collect data, we should think about how we can use the same data for many purposes uh, and make that uh, efficiency really work for us. Uh, and third, uh, because financial stability uh, and vulnerabilities uh, in the financial system is multidimensional, that's why we have a macro prudential toolkit, uh, I think that the data needs are obviously going to be multidimensional as well. Here again, we need to think about um, how best to use those. So that brings me to best practices for filling data needs. Uh, this is really uh, not rocket science, uh, but it does involve thinking hard about what we ought to be doing. The goals are to improve the quality, the scope, and the accessibility of financial data. And to my way of thinking, that means we, we need to align the interests and activities of both officials uh, and industry practitioners. What does that really mean? Uh, I think it means that there's an important complementarity uh, between uh, the interests that each of them share. Obviously, one at the micro level, another at the system-wide level. But having good uh, risk management practices is going to uh, help both microprudential and macroprudential goals. Uh, and understanding what each is doing is going to help the, uh, both parties uh, in the work that they do. Um, in addition, I think there's an important complementarity uh, between analytics and data. And I think Jan Smets referred to this earlier. Uh, in the panel. Theory alone is not going to suffice um, in w when we think about the needs that we have for data, nor will pure observation. Theory must provide a rigorous framework for hypothesis tests, and observation has to ground it in reality. Equally, I think we need rigor in how we go about filling our data needs. So some of the best practices uh, involve the following four steps. First, we need to identify the data needed and their business purpose. Do we really need the data? What is the purpose for which we're going to use the data? Is there more than one purpose? Um, are the data that exist uh, sufficient 
uh, for uh, doing that, or do we need to change those data in some way? Second, we should design a template for the collection of those data. And that means being very specific and prescriptive uh, about the data that we're going to collect and the way that we're going to collect them. Third, I think we need to develop clear and precise definitions of the data that we need so that they align with the purpose that we have uh, in mind. And here, it's extremely important to use uh, industry standards. Philip alluded to that. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And finally, creating collection specifications uh, for the way that we collect data. Um, and I have more on this in a, in a paper that I'm going to submit, but I think all, all four of these best practices are things we should keep uh, in mind when we go to collect data. A few additional thoughts on best practices. One, we should focus on collecting data, not reports. And what do I mean by that? I mean, in the past, regulators have focused on collecting reports uh, and some of the technologies that have been used. For example, in the United States, and the SEC has used EDGAR. The electronification looks just like the paper reports. We should really think, as I mentioned earlier, about collecting the same data that industry uses to manage their risk um, that we're going to use to assess where the risks are in the, in the financial system. Of course, we already do that with swap data. We set up swap data repositories. We're involved very deeply in that uh, when I was in the government from swap data repositories or trade repositories. The problem was that we didn't use effective standards. We didn't use some of the other best practices that were needed to make those data coherent. So both, uh, both are needed. Um, second, we should conduct uh, uh, industry outreach very early in the process to understand whether or not what we have in mind uh, when we go to collect data really reflects what industry is doing. Um, and I think there the alignment and the conversations uh, without involving capture by industry uh, are extremely important. That dialogue is, uh, is very important. Third, in my experience, performing a pilot collection uh, is invaluable in informing how we go about doing the, the larger permanent data collection. We learn a lot from the pilot uh, in securities financing transactions, specifically in in repo in the US. Uh, we learned a lot from uh, a pilot collection that we did. Uh, that's very important. And last, I think we need to engage in evaluating, especially when things are changing, the structure of the financial system, the way that it's evolving to meet new client needs, new technologies. We need to uh, engage in a continuous life cycle, life cycle assessment improvement uh, and data. And this uh, chart illustrates that kind of life cycle improvement, where we start with data requirements, um, we uh, implement those data requirements, uh, we assess the data, we identify data gaps, um, we propose changes to them, uh, and then we evolve in new, uh, in new directions. That may involve no longer collecting some data that are currently being collected because they're no longer relevant. That's all part uh, of the life cycle process. Let me spend a moment on data standards, which was alluded to uh, just briefly. I think they're essential for the quality of data in order to compare, aggregate, and link data sets, and that's been discussed uh, in other panels here. Um, we need to have standardization of data so we know exactly what the data represent um, and uh, so that they can be compared. It's even more critical today uh, to use data standards in representing data because if we're going to automate some of the processes, if we're going to have smart contracts, if we're going to use FinTech effectively, if we're going to use uh, technology for compliance and regulatory purposes, then the data need to be standardized and precisely defined. And of course, you're familiar with some of the identification criteria, uh, both in terms of the LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier, which helps us identify who is who. But equally, um, we need to know who owns what, as Philip alluded to. So the UTI and the UPI work uh, that's gone forward under the FSB and, and other uh, uh, organizations has been very important in that and uh, our engagement uh, in the past with Oral uh, and the Bank of England in that regard I think has been really instrumental in moving that work, uh, moving that work forward. Let me give you three examples of critical data needs for financial stability in which I've been involved. The first, uh, which I alluded to earlier, is uh, in the U.S. repo markets and specifically in the bilateral market, which constitutes roughly half of the market, so this is pretty important for assessing securities financing transactions in the United States. Um, it's critical for, uh, as an ingredient in constructing the U.S. reference rate, the so-called secured overnight financing rate. 
uh, and uh, I think it's essential for financial stability analysis. Philip alluded to the fact that we spent a lot of time on collecting data from banks, but not so much uh, on data outside of uh, the banking system. We obviously need to do more of that. If we focus on activities wherever they occur, like repo transactions, then I think we have a, a good shot uh, at doing that. Related to that, uh, U.S. money market fund holdings, very similar to what's been done here in Europe with the uh, MMSR, uh, the SEC in 2010 started to collect data, but those data were difficult to uh, access. Uh, so the value added that uh, my organization added was uh, to make them much more accessible, both through visualization and creating a database where people could look at the time series of data that was available on a monthly basis and compare and contrast uh, money fund characteristics uh, by who owned them, who issued them, uh, and understanding uh, both on the buy and the sell side of the market uh, what's going on. The third area is in swap transactions. Obviously, that's extremely important, understanding uh, derivatives markets, making them more trans transparent. That's been an extremely important and beneficial uh, development. Uh, it helps us assess risk in markets, uh, the counterparties, and specifically in centrally cleared counterparties. Um, <clears throat> as I alluded to, we did in the United States, uh, and to some extent here, we didn't adequately use data standards uh, and specifics on how to collect those data. So now we're recognizing that that has to be done, and the CFTC, to their credit, uh, has <clears throat> gone back and they've issued, they're going to issue new regulations on how to collect swap data. Uh, there's a very good publication <clears throat> that was put out this spring called Swaps Regulation 2.0 uh, that I think is a good roadmap uh, to, uh, to looking at that. One area that we uh, uh, obviously find a challenge, and I alluded to operational and cyber risks, Data on cyber risks uh, are hard to come by. Uh, we lack data on the scope of incident and their cost. I think in the past there's been a reluctance to report them, a reluctance to understand or a, a, some difficulty in understanding exactly what data uh, should we report and how should we categorize uh, those data. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but there are some straws in the wind that are pretty helpful in that regard. The IMF has done some estimates uh, using uh, data from experts uh, and doing some tail risk analysis to assess the cost of a cyber shock uh, in the financial system. In the United States, the institutional framework has improved uh, for collecting and sharing data through institutions like the so-called FSISAC and FSARC, which are joined together. Those are industry groups uh, that are aimed at uh, sharing and collecting data among the industry. At the regulating uh, level, the so-called FIBIC, uh, the Financial Banking Information Council, uh, is uh, also sharing data and looking at best practices and collecting them. And within firms, firms are setting up what they call fusion centers, which draw uh, all across the firm an interdisciplinary group of people to look at how operational risk can affect every aspect uh, of the firm. So in identifying, detecting, uh, understanding, and recovering from uh, cyber incidents, all these things are extremely important. The governance around this uh, really matters, training uh, employees, making sure that people are aware uh, and what the incident response ought to be. Thinking about how we ought to collect data in this arena is really important. There's been some good work on data, uh, uh, thinking about those, uh, those issues here in Europe uh, with the Euro Cyber Resilience Board and the Threat Intelligence Based uh, Ethical Red Training or Tiber EU uh, institution. Uh, but those are in their infancy, and more work, I think, needs to be needed uh, on that. <clears throat> I'll talk about partnerships again. When we talk about the goals of uh, having a dialogue, either <clears throat> among regulators uh, themselves or between regulators in the industry, I think the goals are really important. They are to use the same data and facts for several purposes. For example, making policy decisions and risk management decisions. And I think it's also essential to have that partnership because we need to think about how we're going to create a new approach to regulatory reporting uh, and compliance. Technology can facilitate that. And I have a vision. Uh, the vision really does involve using the same data uh, at the firm level that we can then aggregate up for policymakers and regulators to have. But in order to do that, 
we need to make our systems uh, interoperable. So there are two venues for collaboration and coordination, I think, that are needed. Among regulators, it's extremely important, so we can share data. In the United States, as all of you know, we have a fragmented regulatory system. Um, to solve the collective action problem of sharing data among the regulators there is still a challenge that regulators uh, are grappling with. And then between regulators and industry, we need to have build trust between the two groups uh, so that that can happen. Final points. I think we need to start expanding the collaboration now, well before that technological revolution uh, is complete. If we don't, uh, then we'll have to redo some of the things uh, that are now being contemplated. Second, I think we need to start improving quality through more extensive use of data standards now. Uh, and third, not just data standards, but I think also technology standards are essential at the start to assure the interoperability of the technological uh, marvels that we're uh, putting in place. Thanks very much. And thank you for your views and again, on a range of issues. I thought these issues about operational risk are, are quite interesting because I guess we usually think as in terms of balance sheets and, uh, and, and income statements and so on, but that these other risks that are emerging now might be coming from some totally different uh, area and require different skills. So, Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Uh, I think we can notice already a statistical oddity. I mean, the uh, previous panel on, on data for monetary policy purpose was a standing panel, and the panel on uh, data for financial stability is a sitting panel. I'm not sure this is, means anything, but um, let's stability. see. Stability, right? <laughs> We, we sit. Okay, so um, I'm going to be trying to s make a point of the necessity, of course, of uh, collecting data and, uh, and new data, but also connecting it to understand uh, what the, <clears throat> the financial stability implications are. <clears throat> so obviously, I think we all know that uh, financial stability has been in, in <clears throat> a concern of policymakers. But it obviously has become something much more uh, present after the, the global financial uh, crisis. And, and maybe let me introduce this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this speech by uh, making a bit of a provocation with uh, my friends from the previous panels, the Monetary Policy uh, uh, Committee uh, guys. I think probably you have an easier life than the guys sitting in financial stability committees. In what sense? I mean, we know that even with the caveat of not understanding perfectly well where Air Star is, that uh, price stability is perhaps easier, more measurable, more direct than, than financial stability, which is a, a pretty uh, complicated multidimensional concept, right? So the life in, in MPCs, in monetary policy committees, have a procedure, a clear objective, a metric, and uh, as, as was discussed previously, sort of reliance on relatively straightforward uh, data sets on inflation, expectations, output, wages, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, as uh, Ewald uh, mentioned, there was some complications. You want to think of housing costs, or, or, or if you want to be, get more granular, use scanner data. But overall, the, the life is probably simpler. If you are sitting in a financial stability uh, committee, you have this complex task of first find the, the metric. I mean, why is it, after all, financial stability? Uh, is there anyone that can sort of define it uh, properly, given that it faces uh, uh, very complicated issues of understanding what is systemic risk and, and the, the capacity for this risk to, to change? So obviously, you can say, look, obviously, if you have more data, you can help policymakers with that, and you can anticipate uh, and probably manage the next uh, financial crisis. But it, it might not be sufficient because of this complexity. And what I would try to argue in, in, throughout this, uh, this presentation is that as much as data is necessary, the theoretical analytical framework with which you analyze it is also uh, uh, paramount. 
So why is it uh, so? Uh, because the scientific discovery is, is, is not just uh, assessing data and, uh, and, and trying to pull. Uh, it, it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, even if sometimes accidents help, accidents only help, as uh, Louis Pasteur used to say, those who can interpret what these accidents are. Uh, and, uh, well, Yogi Berra, as you know, the, uh, the baseball player, uh, used to say it in, in a more uh, humorous way. Uh, if you really don't know exactly what you're trying to achieve, even if you have a pile of data, it doesn't help you, right? You just get more confused. And, and uh, somebody was mentioning the cost of collecting data, so you're going to spend a lot of money without helping you to understand what financial stability is about. Now, hopefully, I think we have evolved in financial stability analysis from the sort of very nice, uh, broad uh, uh, narratives that you can find in, uh, in classical uh, works, in Kinderberger, in Minsky, to something that is much more specific, which is to identify uh, things that we can say, look, these are early warnings indicators of, of crisis. And this is data that uh, pertains to this uh, category because it has some predictive uh, power. And of course, the more you advance in the understanding of uh, modern financial uh, crisis, the more you try to find exactly what is the data that can allow you to, uh, to, to fill these gaps, to identify the early warning uh, indicators. And we all know that uh, ex post, it is very easy to say, look, this was precisely the stuff that created the, the financial crisis that we are analyzing. What is complicated is ex ante. What exactly is the, the type of uh, vulnerability that is hidden, that is slowly uh, undermining the financial stability of the system, creating systemic risk? And it's not necessarily showing up in the type of information that, uh, that we have. Think of, for example, the mispricing of uh, risk, Think of the uh, analysis of rare disaster events that are very difficult to, to predict. So in other words, the point is that data is, of course, uh, relevant and, um, and important. But you need, theoret you need a theory to be capable of fitting the data into something that is meaningful for preventing uh, financial crisis and helping you to maintain financial uh, stability. So as much as collecting data, collecting dots is necessary, connecting them is also something that is very important. Now, even if you have a theory, mind you, it might be even also tricky. Because it doesn't mean that uh, if you have a, a theoretical framework about the financial crisis, that you'll be able to interpret things in a straightforward way. Why is it so? Because we, are, we know that uh, the theories behind the interpretations of financial crisis are full of false beliefs. Uh, remember this famous uh, line uh, with uh, Ken Rogoff and, and, and Carmen Reynard that there is always a story about, oh, this time is different. In other words, the data that we have doesn't tell you exactly the truth. Or the data that we have, we don't really interpret it the way it should be interpreted because this time is different. For example, in Latin America, countries do not go bankrupt. During the Asian crisis, remember people say, oh, we have so much growth, uh, high savings, and solid public finance that uh, it can support uh, higher levels of, of debt. And of course, we all know during the GFC that uh, we, were, uh, we used to, um, to sort of uh, say, look, uh, financial uh, innovation, uh, spreading risk, uh, and uh, something that enhances uh, stability. So in all these episodes, we had data. We, were, we had the theory, but we were not really capable of interpret them. And of course, after interpreting them, to take corrective uh, action. So where do, where do we stand? I think, look. We do have some stuff that resembles data that can be considered some early warning indicators of uh, uh, episodes that disrupt financial stability. We are still missing a, a bigger, robust, theoretical and analytical framework to understand endogeneity of uh, financial crisis. 
But we do have, let's say, rough estimates at an aggregate level of, of things that obviously we all know create uh, uh, unsustainable imbalances. And we have data about that. Uh, credit to GDP gaps, uh, uh, procyclicality of, uh, of uh, borrowing and uh, excessive risk taking. But uh, the, the more, probably the more, the, the, the more we understand the financial uh, crisis, the more we understand also that beyond these aggregates, you need granularity as uh, was discussed here uh, in the previous uh, panel. And granularity on financial uh, data, exposures. Uh, we, we know that everybody all of a sudden discovered that they were exposed to Lehman. Uh, interconnectedness between uh, GCIBs. Uh, now we know them, but before that we, we neglected that. Uh, uh, OTC derivatives and, and so on and so forth. So the hope is that we are sort of assembling this data set about uh, early warnings. And uh, the whole idea is to see if, if with this, with the stuff that we know now, it can help uh, policymakers to anticipate, to prevent crisis, because that's the, that's the game, right? You, you don't want just to understand crisis, you want to understand uh, with data that you can sort of see the early warning and then take a remedial action before the crisis uh, blow up. Obviously, we are increasingly aware that the international dimensions of crisis is, is paramount. Uh, needless to say, globalization of finance the, uh, is, is, is uh, obvious for, as, as a factor of, of risk in, in, uh, in all our analysis, the interconnectedness. We know that uh, the transmission was sudden, brutal, uh, from the subprime in the US to European banks. Uh, we need uh, essentially to understand the proliferation of these uh, products, and, and we do have now data on that, on bond markets, on non-bank intermediaries. I think uh, uh, Philip and Richard mentioning the need to assemble enterprise data on this. I think uh, we, we understand now the importance of collecting data on asset managers' positions, uh, on, on global CCPs, and also on some very big uh, emerging markets that I, I, I would call systemically important middle-income uh, countries. Because why? Because they are highly interconnected, interconnected with uh, uh, our, our financial uh, systems and because they are prone to, let's say, crises uh, in the periphery of the system, they can cause spillbacks and they can sort of produce uh, spillbacks that are severe enough to cause financial crises in the advanced economies. And, and of course, then we need data about these cross-border flows, cross-border exposures, which hopefully now we begin uh, to, to have. Uh, finally, a tricky thing is that um, um, you have stuff that you don't necessarily know now that is a vulnerability in, uh, in, uh, in the making. You, you have a suspicion that this is dangerous, uh, dangerous, dangerous for the stability of the system but not necessarily an awareness of where does it fit into the building of uh, risk. Uh, well, everybody spoke here about uh, innovation, financial innovation, but think of uh, uh, having uh, uh, more data on, the, on networks, on interconnectedness, on, on trade repositories, and, and uh, on fintech, of course, on, on, uh, on crypto assets, on, on algorithmic trading. Uh, and of course, uh, I think it was mentioned before, if you do have uh, a, a, an avenue to explore is to look at, uh, at, uh, at, big, uh, at big data. How could this bring in terms of new information for financial uh, stability? Now, if you don't know stuff in your area, which is economics and finance, maybe you can ask for a little help from other disciplines like uh, physics, for example. Uh, we know that there are some people uh, looking at uh, uh, network analysis uh, to, I think, uh, Ardor uh, mentioned this at the beginning, the necessity to understand contagion, linkages. Uh, but but the, the point is, okay, you have a network. Is it a stable network? Is it something that you can observe as a static thing or something that will shift and change immediately if uh, market positions uh, move. 
In the same uh, line, uh, you have now physicists that, that, can, that are exploring ways to model uh, uh, what is exactly that causes the changes between um, solid states to, to unstable, which you can consider more stable states, to uh, liquid states or, or states that you can consider more unstable. Should, you, should we as, as, uh, as uh, economists and uh, policy makers try to explore a little bit what uh, this, is, this is bringing to us? And would that, would that be useful for, for policy makers? Uh, we, we don't know. And of course, uh, last but not the least, uh, what big data can, can bring us to understand better uh, financial uh, uh, stability. Uh, I think we, we all know that this is coming, that we can have uh, real-time data affecting uh, the, the, the major agents in the system, and I think we should explore that, global banks, the interconnectedness of uh, financial institution. I think it was mentioned here, uh, mortgage debt, uh, debt uh, household debt, of course, how it can transmit instability into the system and how, of course, the granular data about uh, uh, credit can, can help us. And, and this is, a, as, as we know, it's, a, it's a, a challenge that goes much beyond just the capacity to, uh, to accumulate this information. Uh, it's not just an IT, uh, an IT uh, problem. Uh, now, uh, to, to sort of move to the end of, of this presentation, uh, I think, well, we have, let's say, some stuff about early warnings. We need to assemble new data. We can use big data. We can use uh, different types of disciplines to understand the, the dynamics behind the, this complex notion of financial stability. But we also need, perhaps, to have stuff to present, uh, to prevent financial crisis. And I'm, I'm, I'm here thinking of this array of macroprudential tools that we are learning to understand. I think Philip mentioned this as an important element to reduce excessive uh, risk uh, taking. And, and obviously, if you want to measure the effectiveness of these instruments of macroprudential tools, and, and there is an array of them in, in, in our toolkit, uh, you need to have data sets to understand how they, they play with other macro and financial variables, credit growth, uh, and balance sheets of institutions. And fortunately, they are. We are at the beginning of a process of uh, developing several data sets for, uh, for, with researchers, with an effort by uh, uh, the BIS, but also, of course, the IMF and, and the FSB. And there are several of these data sets that are available where, where you can understand the interplay between the, the fact that you use an instrument, uh, a macro pro instrument, and the capacity to bend the excessive risk taking in a financial cycle. Problem with these data sets is they are binary. So you have only the plus one, minus one for tightening or loosening, and zero for stationary. Might not be enough for, for doing a, a sound econometric exercise uh, with this type of data set, but I think it's very important to have them. Finally, to, to conclude, uh, okay, so with all this, what I would say is the, uh, the first policy implication uh, in order to uh, gather data to uh, uh, help us uh, to maintain <coughs> financial stability. As I mentioned at the beginning, first thing, I would improve data for early warning purposes. Which, which would uh, which would start uh, uh, looking at the diversity of of things maybe outside a little bit the the uh, the domain that that we know uh, because uh, I think we need to be a bit more creative uh, uh, focusing on financial stability means focusing on on rare on uh, uh, large disasters and and if you take the analogy of, of climate change. Uh, you need to, to be capable of modeling and understanding with data these more rare uh, events, uh, which, which means that uh, you need to <clears throat> um, start looking at, uh, uh, at uh, these um, uh, rare events in a, with a different lens, and the data that you need for that is perhaps different. Just to, to, to make myself uh, clear, uh, think of one event which is uh, uh, the, the development of big tech firms in, in, in payments, in system payments 
uh, that are very reliant now uh, in, in them. Take, take for example, Alipay uh, in China, or Tencent in China, or WePay in China. I mean, these guys are, have half a, bi half a billion customers. They are basically assuring uh, the, uh, the transactions, the monetary transactions, the payment transactions of very, very large segments of the consumer market in, 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 in Asia. And if, if by any chance they, they have a reputation of failure, remember the, the Facebook episode where there was this uh, distrust because of uh, the leakage of private data? Suppose that you have one of these big guys that also get one of these episodes. What would be the consequences for the stability of the payments system in, in China? Of course, if it is in China, it is in the whole world. So this is the angle, the, 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 the novel angle, which I think we should get into if we want to have data that, uh, that provokes us uh, the, the tilt for an early uh, warning. And, and finally, of course, uh, we, we need data uh, in financial stability to quantify uh, policy trade-offs. I think you need, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, to have a sound theoretical framework for that. So you need data to feed this theoretical framework. For me, to explore policy trade-offs, you need to be working in a general equilibrium uh, framework, but, but you need, above all, to understand how the real economy interacts with the financial sector. So whether it is formally modeled as a financial sector within a general equilibrium framework, or whether it is just a financial frictions, you need to have data for that. You need to have an explicit uh, way in which you, you understand this, this interaction so that you can test policy uh, trade-offs. And of course, while you do all this, you need to work on the resilience of, of the system. And for that, you need, of course, data to understand if, you're, if, if the, the system as it is now, with your capital requirements, with your reserve requirements, uh, with your deposit insurance schemes, is resilient enough. Fortunately, uh, because of the crisis, we've been doing just that in the G20, in the FSB, at the BIS, and other forums so that we can now have a, a, a core of the financial system that is more resilient than before the uh, crisis. So thank you, I stop here. Thank you, Luis, and uh, I think I like the point about the, the lens and the theory becoming more and more uh, important as, as all this stuff becomes much more complex. Uh, this point about knowing where you're going before you start, and I think it linked to Richard's best practice uh, principles were along the same lines. So Hans Helmut, why don't you bring all this together in 10 minutes? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ado. It's a great honor and pleasure to be on this panel, and it was really inspiring because the privilege of discussing this, uh, these arguments was uh, having access to the papers beforehand. So. Um, since this, by the way, is also a little bit about celebrating um, Augel, um, who gave me, by the way, the assignment to be provocative. So if I'm not polite, it's his fault. Um, my idea was basically to, to summarize very briefly what we heard. There's a lot of overlap between this panel and, by the way, the panel before. And then bark uh, up the same tr uh, tree as basically all of us did, uh, it's ultimately theory which we have to care about. Because to quote a famous economist, um, Marshall, uh, facts don't tell their own story. So in order to make data meaningful, as you said, you have to think about what are we trying to, to think about here. So what I'd like to do is so I'll be impolite in summarizing the three presentations in one page. Frugal, austere, impolite. And I summarize it the way I received the presentations. So Dick Berner was um, starting with what we should ultimately care about if you're thinking about financial stability issues, namely vulnerabilities. And they might come up in interesting places which we wouldn't have thought of. Now, try to highlight or emphasize this point in a few slides later on. Uh, then he carefully insists upon improving data quality, which is scope as well as ex access. 
and also new means to read and interpret data. Um, one can be, get easily very excited about uh, these new ways of interpreting uh, data, but I do think it's important to, to, to start from the idea, which is an old one, technologies change, the fundamental laws of economics often don't, or rarely do. So uh, this is often deeply uh, rooted in, in what we knew uh, or learned, learned before. Philip Lane stressed the cross-border, the multidimensional, uh, the financial stability dimension, which arises out of the repercussions and interactions. That's a very important part, uh, in particular within the euro area, where you, where you still have lots of national idiosyncrasies, and as a result of that, uh, repercussion. Internationally, it means all those supporting all those efforts which have been launched in the wake of the crisis in 2009, in the environment of the FSB. The FSB has been, by the way, not starting from data, but starting from a list of seven issues which should be uh, addressed. That, that was in September 2009. So the, the core uh, of policies at that time conceived was about addressing underlying real economic problems. As, in order to do that, think about what, what data you would need to do that. Uh, Lewis um, highlighted that the, the, the issue of, so it's much easier to work in, in, in the monetary committee than to work in the financial stability committee because you do not have a well-defined objective. It's fuzzy, uh, it's complex. Uh, as a result of, uh, of that, uh, you don't really know what type of data you, you, you need. Ultimately, you might not even know which type of data you need exposed. So there's still discussion what uh, was at the source of the Great Depression in the early 30s. So you, you, can, have, you, can, you can have contentious debate about uh, things long back in, in history. Uh, so. I would like to start with, an, with an, an incident which was important in terms of redesigning the institutions we now have, which is, um, which is basically what happened in 2007-2008. Uh, so the main questions I do think we have to care about are, do we have the right data? Which data should we look for? Um, what do we do with this data, and how should we, or how, how should we derive policies from there? So, what I'd like to start with is um, summer 2007. These are data. It's a graph. I don't know if I can. So, so here you see spread of spreads of secured over unsecured interbank money. Uh, for the long stretch of history, barely five to seven basis points, and suddenly it shot up dramatically. So what do we do with this? How do we read this? And we were sitting at the time in the monetary committee and thinking about what's, 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 what's behind that. So what is, what is unusual? So we have data, but how do we interpret them? So one argument behind that has been this is the implosion of interbank money markets. And it was driven by the unraveling of uh, subprime, subprime uh, insurance uh, products. Um, and a major issue there is what, what I would like to call foresight knowledge. We always read these graphs from right to left. So we are sitting here and have to think about what's going to happen here. That's why definitely an anchoring in, in, in theory is, is needed. This is important because uh, policy or theory should ultimately do to policy advice. In 2007, there were two views of what was going on. One was, this is information asymmetry. Um, market will find an, an, an equilibrium, let's stay on the, on, on, on the sideline. The other was, it's a run. It's a run of wholesale banks 
on each other. The conclusion which the ECB at the time drew was to inject liquidity. That's here. That's August 8, 9, 2007. At the time, it was, by the way, criticized as hyperactive and panicky. I don't know how you call this. So, um, theory should inform ultim ultimately uh, 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 policy. So, in the meantime, we've achieved many, uh, uh, many institutional in innovations. We've been filling data gaps. I just uh, clicked th uh, uh, through them. In particular, in, in terms of the European system of central banks, uh, integrated reporting frameworks, um, an integrated vocabulary, so common view. So now, let me, let me dig a little bit deeper into theory. Um, financial crises are, and he has been quoted by, by you, Luis, according to Kindleberger, uh, hardy perennial. Usually it has been three points, over leverage, mismatches, underpricing of risk, and interconnectedness, which has become over the last decades um, very much international. So Philip has highlighted that. So that's where we should look for in terms of which data we would like to see. And it is about um, how markets can become dysfunctional, how intermediaries can uh, become dysfunctional. This is credit, credit gap. It could also be mispricing of, of term premier and, and, uh, and uh, uh, risk premier. And the interaction between funding and market liquidity. So those were the places where I do think we need theory as well as data to uh, to understand what ultimately is important for us, namely what, what's going to happen in the, in the real economy. So, what does this lead me to, uh, to, to suggest? Uh, we have to develop and critically assess analytical tools, and there is not one right model. Um, this also, of course, holds true for the new devices, and it holds true for thinking about how we derive arguments from looking at individual cases. Um, no one right model. You might recall the Jackson Hole conference in 2005 when Raghu Rajan suggested that as a result of using micro, uh, instru micro insurance instrument, uh, macro trouble should, should, uh, could easily uh, arise. He was heavily criticized. Uh, so one suggestion would be um, beware of, beware of um, um, groupthink. Try to integrate uh, critical views. Uh, so there's also, and uh, Luis pointed to that, there's not only a need for inter, but I would say also for interdisciplinary uh, uh, debates. Uh, finally, I think it goes much beyond uh, cognition. Um, early on in the crisis, there was talk about an, a window of opportunity which was about to be lost. <laughs> And now we have talk about rollback. So I don't completely agree with Dick in terms of this complementarity between industry and, uh, and policymakers. I do think policymakers are providing a public good, financial stability, which does not always uh, align with what uh, private sector ent entities would like to see. For example, capital requirements. Um, have been criticized as much too high. That's why you have this rollback argument. So central banks are somehow in a role of benevolent dictators. And that means they need discretion, they need judgment, um, and they have to communicate with the, with the general public. So maybe this one, the policy dimension, is the most um, difficult one. Um, 
So, and that's what I want to conclude with. Data never tell their own story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans Helmut. Uh, do any of the would any of the speakers like to react, Philip or Dick or Luis? Okay, and then we'll okay. open up. One of the uh, recurrent uh, uh, issues in this uh, panel so far has been this issue about uh, the interaction between data and analytics. Now, I think that is true. So it, it does uh, mean uh, within our organisations it's very important that the statisticians have a vibrant dialogue both with the macro monetary economists and with the supervisors. So actually, so in terms of having a, a single uh, uh, data set to collect uh, and how to interpret, and what questions to ask, I think that's very important. But I think it's also probably important to emphasize is it's, it's, it's very much a dynamic relationship because theory is not static. Uh, I mean, there's an old uh, joke about economics, which is the uh, empirical guy is saying to the modeler, you know, tell, tell me your model and I will you know, find a way to, to look for it in the data. And the modelers are going, tell me the data and I'll dream up the model to match the data. And so there's always going to be that dynamic, which is the models written now are heavily, often the first page of a theory paper is going to be, well, based on the data we see. Uh, I'm now going to write a model to, to replicate some features of the data. So it, it's a two-way street there, uh, and I think that that's um, quite important. And then the other thing that Hans Helmut uh, uh, raised, which Peter Pratt this morning also signaled, which is what is the role of uh, markets data? So one level, you know, maybe it's a substitute for uh, collecting uh, institutional data. If, if the market is telling you what's going on, uh, you know, we do think uh, it's one of the uh, pillars of financial stability is to market discipline and to see what we can infer from markets data. But it does run into, into the limit because the markets also learn from, from us because the public good of statistics is not something that any individual market trader or uh, institution uh, can uh, replicate on their own. I mean, this goes back to what some of you were saying, which is essentially it's in the interest of industry that there are good uh, data sets that they can also use for their own analysis. So uh, my, again, uh, come back to what I said earlier on, I do think uh, we're in this kind of uh, intermediate phase that a lot has been done, but the interaction between the markets, uh, the institutions, uh, academics, it, it's a very fluid interaction and we're, we're far from uh, having a true view of the world that we, that we can you know, guide that. We, we have to recognize the uh, dynamic element of that. Okay, just uh, as, as much as I think uh, everybody here, and I, I, I did emphasize the need for a theory, a framework, uh, to collect the right set of data, to look at the right set of data, there are also a very important role the statisticians and, and, and data brings to policy makers in a more common sense thing. I, I remember when I was sitting in the Financial Stability Committee of the Central Bank of Brazil, and, and uh, people were bringing us data about uh, uh, loans to used cars uh, with LTVs of 150%. Uh, and maturities of seven years. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that this is absolutely wrong and that you need to act on that. So you don't need a big theory to use the appropriate set of data that people are bringing you to take immediate actions for a localized financial stability, which was the car uh, market uh, in Brazil. So I'd make two comments. One in response to what Hans said. Uh, I want to emphasize the fact that when I talk about a partnership, um, or alignment of interest between industry and regulators, there's an important asymmetry there, obviously, because system-wide uh, financial stability uh, policies are needed because neither risk management uh, at the micro level nor mi micro prudential policies are really sufficient to deal with uh, the system-wide externalities and market failures that really can arise uh, from asymmetric information and mispriced guarantees, mispriced credit. Totally acknowledge that. Um, but there does need to be a dialogue, I think, between them so that they can better understand what their uh, respective goals are. Second, none of us have really mentioned uh, a key uh, use uh, of financial stability data, namely stress testing, a workhorse tool 
uh, for uh, implementing macroprudential policies and filling in the gaps where we don't have counterfactuals uh, to observe uh, and to understand what the impact of our, uh, our tools uh, can be. So we need to work on the, uh, the framework for stress testing. I think that's particularly true with respect to um, operational risk, which I mentioned earlier. It's particularly true with respect to uh, CCPs and how to do stress testing uh, for CCPs. Does it make sense to test them um, one by one? Uh, I think not. I think we have to test, uh, do stress testing for CCPs in the context uh, of their relationship with their clearing members and other counterparties uh, and with the system as a whole because they're so highly interconnected. Those are really important issues. And we ought to think about the granularity that we really need in stress testing, which is uh, intense for CCPs, but it may not be so intense for uh, less complex, uh, smaller uh, entities, such as some of the smaller community banks that we have in the United States. We ought to differentiate the way that we use these tools um, by where we think the risk is. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have about 15 minutes officially uh, I don't think we want to eat too much into the lunch uh, break, so uh, we'll collect maybe three questions at a time and then address them to specific people or the panel. 